So one paper that I'm currently working on that I'm really excited about is a project with Seema Jayachandran at Northwestern University, where we're studying the importance of attending kindergarten in rural India. So we have a good amount of research on the importance of early childhood education in developed contexts, particularly in the United States with programs like Head Start or the Peri Obsidian Project. Uh, but we don't really have any, close to any experimental evidence from a developing setting. And you could imagine that the effects are quite different because, for example, if kids don't go to Head Start in the US, their parents can still you know, uh, provide other educational inputs like uh, books at home, uh, other forms of educational after-school activities, whereas we might believe in these kind of rural Indian villages where we're working, the other options are much more limited. And so in order to assess, answer this question, two years ago, uh, Seema and I randomized scholarships to attend a high-quality private kindergarten franchise uh, for two years. And then at the end of the two years, this past spring, we followed back up with the children and measured their development. And we find pretty large impacts across the board on everything from language to math to creativity to reasoning to memory skills. Uh, uh, and it's really hard to compare across contexts, but it seems like these impacts are much bigger than we would expect the impacts to be in kind of a developed setting. And obviously this isn't the end of the story. This was just at the end of preschool. So this year, right now, as we speak, they're in a primary school completing kind of first grade. Uh, and we're planning on following up with them in the spring again to see if these uh, gains have increased or decreased. Um, one thing we're particularly excited about is the possibility that the gains would increase. And one reason that this might be the case is there's anecdotal evidence that teachers in India are incentivized to teach to uh, the very top of the class because they get rewarded when students pass these very tough exams. And so it's not within the teacher's interests to teach to the very poorest performing students, which means that if you come into kindergarten or you come into first grade, uh, underprepared, you maybe don't even understand what your teacher is saying to you. And so it could be that by giving these kids an early boost up, we've pushed them into the zone of the classroom where they actually understand what the teacher is saying. And we could imagine that not only do they get an initial boost, but they then have the ability to understand their teachers and they continue on kind of an upward trajectory. And who knows what we'll actually find, but it's something that I'm excited about. So one paper that's really influenced my work is this paper by Banerjee et al, where they look at ways to increase vaccination rates among children in Rajasthan, India. And what the paper finds is that small gifts, like giving away a kilogram of lentils in exchange for bringing your kid to get vaccinated, can have huge impacts on the number of children getting vaccinated to the point that it's even more cost effective to do that than to just have clinics and hope that people show up. And I think that that's a very interesting result because it suggests that human behavior works in ways that we don't always expect that it will and suggests ways to cheaply improve a lot of outcomes that we care about. Yeah, so one question that I think is starting to get a lot of attention is how do we design policies and government procedures that take into account the cognitive constraints that the citizens face. Uh, and what I mean by that is we for a long time have been very focused on making sure that government programs benefit only the people that they are specifically designed to benefit. So for example, uh, the, in Indonesia, uh, there's free rice that's given away. There's a lot of effort to make sure that the free rice doesn't go to people who don't need it. And one way that you uh, can do that is by making the act of getting the rice very complicated. So you need to apply for a form, you need to stand in line, you maybe make the rice not as high quality, you make someone have to walk a really long way. And the thinking to date has been that these kinds of barriers or ordeals mean that the only people who will bother to get the rice are the people that actually really need it. That's perfectly sensible, and that makes a lot of good sense in a world in which people have kind of unlimited mental resources and can perfectly optimize over all of the choices that are available to them. But if you believe that people's 
environments limit the kind of cognitive excess capacity that they will. And in particular, if you think that poor people's cognitive resources are more taxed by their environments, by having to worry about where they're going to get money to put food on the table the next day, you could imagine that these kind of ordeal mechanisms have the exact opposite effect. The person that has the time to sort through all of this kind of complex paperwork and walk to the village is precisely the person who doesn't really need the extra rice. Because the person who needs the rice doesn't have time to deal with this because they're worrying about how they're going to put food on the table that day, they're worrying about how they're going to get their kids to school, they're worrying about the health condition of one of their parents. And there isn't a lot of research yet that thinks about how we should trade off these two kinds of uh, opposing forces and whether we should be m making things work easier so that you can kind of alleviate these cognitive constraints versus the real risk that we will be spending money on giving benefits to people who don't necessarily need them and making these programs more expensive than they need to be. Hi, I'm Josh Dean. I'm a postdoc here at Brick.